My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. I'm your host, Era. Today, I have Genevieve, who is a serial entrepreneur, uh, who's going to be jumping on the podcast to kind of share her journey and talk about some of the things she's kind of learned. Uh, and some of the things she's also passionate about outside of that. So she's currently the co-founder of a company called Mehera Mindfulness, which is a contemporary lifestyle brand based in Canada. She also runs a side hustle, which I think is pretty cool, the County Wine Tours in Prince Edward County. Um, and you know, before kind of getting into uh, the world of entrepreneurship, she spent over a decade in leading marketing communications for agencies, corporations, and charitable organizations. So um, without further ado, I'll let Genevieve kind of introduce herself and say her last name because I was going to butcher it. So Genevieve, why don't we kind of jump into it? Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be on this podcast with you. So I am Genevieve Savandranayagam. I am one of the co-founders of Mahara Mindfulness. And as you mentioned, it is a contemporary lifestyle brand that offers people really a stepping stone into a world of mindful practices and personal transformation. And prior to launching that, I worked um, in marketing communications for most of my career. So I worked with advertising companies, PR agencies, nonprofit, corporate, um, the whole spectrum, which has been really exciting. And I think what I needed before I started this entrepreneurial journey. Um, and when I'm not traveling, I'm always traveling. So I'm always escaping <laughs> the mountains or immersing myself in nature. And I really am a curious person and I love to learn about people and understand human behavior. Um, and I think that's what really drew me to travel because I love just immersing myself in different cultures as well. I would say um, mindfulness has been a really important part of my life since I was a child. I was actually born in Sri Lanka uh, and came to Canada with my family, so my parents and my two older sisters. I, uh, I was six years old when we came and we left due to the civil war there. Um, I would say our childhood wasn't easy. Um, it was very challenging, but I would definitely say looking back now, I am extremely grateful for where I come from and the experiences that I've had because it's really shaped who I am today. Um, I witnessed a lot of tragedy probably at a very young age, but I learned very quickly how transient life is and really how important it is to live in the present moment and be in flow so you can navigate life the way you want to, the way you want to. Um, and I do think my upbringing, upbringing and childhood really taught me that quite quickly. Um, I also think bu building Mahara now has been a true gift because it allows me to really um, expand on what I've learned over the years and really it's an outlet now that helps me take it a step further and help others along their their journey through life in a way. Yeah before we kind of get into you know the exciting kind of entrepreneurial journey you've kind of taken um, I think a lot of people listening and I think especially because of COVID you know there's a lot of people that are kind of had a similar background to you working in a corporate environment for quite a bit of time then COVID happened we got to sit home for a year and a half two years you know, having more time to contemplate, think about what's really important. Um, and there's probably people like you that made that, that want to make that switch over to the entrepreneurial side or the dark side. Um, so what prompted you to kind of make that switch, you know, after doing a decade in kind of the corporate world to, you know, I think it was Prince, um, sorry, the County Wine Tours that kind of started it, but what made you jump into that world? Well, I would say I've always known I wanted to work for myself one day. So I think as a child, I had that in me. Um, and I always gravitated to taking on roles and careers that allowed me to um, build all the skills I needed to be an entrepreneur. So I always look back at my career and every choice that I made as a lesson in entrepreneurship. Um, and I see that now in hindsight, I probably didn't realize it as I was going through the motions. Um, but I always gravitated to roles, roles that challenged me, that I had to dive in head first, that didn't have any structure. I loved building teams. I loved working on challenging projects. So I think my career really kind of groomed me to, to be an entrepreneur. And I would say taking that final leap uh, was really not because I didn't like my career. It was more because I realized there was more that I needed to be doing. And 
one of the greatest fears I have in life is not living to my full capacity. And I hit that point where I realized there was something missing. I needed to do something more. And the County Winters was something that I started with my two good friends about five years ago. And that was a really good side hustle. And that was really just a fun project we started, which became a real business. And then I also got a taste of entrepreneurship um, a while ago as well, when I helped start up a PR agency, just building it from the ground up. So I saw what it took to start a company, build a website, get clients and build it out. So I've had a few sort of um, tastes of what entrepreneurship was like, but never gone in full time. And basically what happened was I reached a point where I realized I needed to do more and I needed to take that leap. And the idea to build a wellness business came about a few years ago before we even launched or I quit my job, but I just never moved it forward in the way I wanted to. And my co-founder, she was on a similar journey where she was at that point in her career where she was ready to make a change. And both of us were really, um, we were really committed to mindfulness. We really cared about that space. And we decided, okay, we have this business idea. We either do it now or we just let it go. And we both decided we would have a lot of regret if we didn't go for it. So this was before COVID hit, we decided we we're gonna quit. We quit our jobs in February. And then two weeks later, the pandemic hit and our initial business plans really went out the window and we had to pivot quite quickly and figure out what we would do. But um, that was really the journey. I actually don't regret at all that I worked in corporate and I worked for a while before I started the business because I recognize now that I'm in it, how much I appreciate all the skills that I've learned and that I can apply to my day-to-day -day work now. So building a business, um, you mentioned kind of your other business where you co-founded with friends. Um, and then with uh, Mahara Mindfulness, I believe the co your co-founder is one of the co-founders from yeah. County Wine Tours. How did you make that decision to co-found a company? Because being a co-founder with one of my good friends as well, or in a couple of different things, it's very tricky to be good friends with somebody and build a business because obviously it's a, it's a messy affair. It could be a messy affair, especially at the beginning, a lot of challenges. How did you decide who to kind of build a company with? And kind of how do you navigate that fine line between friendship and you know being co-founders? Yeah, well, I never really had a process for thinking about it that way. I always knew, I think, again, if I think back to my career, my experience, I've had a lot of exposure to different people, different working styles, different leadership styles, and I knew the ones I worked best with, the type of people I worked really well with. So I knew the qualities that I would look for in a co-founder from a skills standpoint and dynamic. When it comes to working with friends, it brings another set of challenges because you don't want your business relationship to impact your friendship. And I think the only way it really works when it comes to doing bringing that together is having a strong foundation as a friendship, having utter trust with your friends, and then really, really open communication. So I would say when the County Wine Tours, when we started it, so my co-founders, Aaron and Shiva, the three of us are really good friends. We had all worked together, met at a PR agency 13 years ago that we started out at. And we all knew each other. We didn't work actually on the same teams, but we all knew that we were high achievers on the teams. We all knew that we were hard workers and we were innovative and thinking outside the box. So we all knew each other in that working sense. And then, um, we decided to take that leap and it worked out well. For Mahara, it was a bigger decision because so Shiva and I at the time, we were even roommates. So not only roommates mm -hmm. working together and good friends and business, it was, it was a lot. So we actually sat down and talked about it quite openly. How do we make this work and what's important? And so communication was key. Anytime if we had any issues, we're two people who are not scared to say how we feel. So we talk it out and then we let it go. We figure out the solution and we don't hold grudges. We don't take anything personally. Um, we have now, it's been a year and a half or so since we quit our jobs and we've been doing this and it's worked quite well. Like we're really upfront. We're really open and honest. And we have, we just are so aligned in terms of our vision and our mission, what we want to do with this business. So I would say it worked out well for us, but it I think if anyone's looking for co-founders, it's finding people who you can work well with because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them day in and day out. 
who have similar work ethic, I think that's important. So I know Shiva and I are hard workers and we care about quality. We care about the same things. We also have the same values. We trust each other and ultimately we respect each other. So we, if there is ever an issue, we are able to work through it. Got it. And I mean, just a, a follow-up question to that, and you can answer it however you want to. Um, I, when we, when I did my first startup, I never really had a shareholder agreement. First of all, because I didn't know what it was, I didn't know the value of it. And a shareholder agreement is just kind of like the constitution, like or like you know, like laws. You don't really need yeah. to know them until something really bad happens. So you hope you never get there. Um, so yeah. out of curiosity, was that something that you put into place right away, or was it kind of let's kind of wait and see how this goes before? doing all that work and you know spending resources on that so we we didn't do a shareholder agreement we knew we always wanted to because we knew we needed to get that done we were just ready to get started what we did do up front was we actually had a um, a document that we outlined all the key things that were concerns or issues that may come up so we said okay friendship comes first what do we do we disagree on xyz and we said this is a solution how do we manage through the potential things that can come up? Even though we're great friends, we're gonna be working together 24 seven, there's going to be issues. So we had an upfront conversation before we started anything and we wrote those things down. And we both agreed, this is what we do. Even up to the, um, even in terms of whether one person decided a year and they didn't wanna be doing this business and they wanted a stable job again, what does that mean? So we actually talked through all of those questions. We wrote it out. Um, so we were aligned day one. We didn't have a formal shareholder agreement where we've only gotten that in place now, but um, initially we did it. Oh, but it sounds like what you talked about is probably like way, I don't remember having those kind of conversations. So that's amazing yeah. that you kind of even um, had kind of the, the thought process to do that. Um, well, I had a lot more concerns and Shiva was just like, I know it's meant to be, we're going <laughs> to we're we're make this work. So she was all for it. I was like, oh, I just want to make sure no matter what doesn't, because for me, friendships and relationships and family always come before a business. So it was really important that th those conversations were had. And I'm glad we did because it's been, it's been great so far. We've had challenges. We've had disagreements. We've had all of those things, but we've been able to work through. Work through That's all. amazing. Um, so let's get to the meat of the matter, which is Mahara Mindfulness, and um, tell us a bit about kind of how the idea came about, the name, and like why are, why are you so excited by this? Well, mindfulness is something, as I mentioned, like since I was a kid, I've always been really connected to my spirit. I always knew, I think, partly because of where I come from and how I was raised. So I was raised Catholic. So we always grew up in a spiritual household and prayer was important and community was important. And, um, but I always, you know, in my own way as a child, always explored my inner world and that being side of life. And Shiva in her own way, we come from very different worlds. She was on a similar journey where she was really, um, interested in self-development, mindfulness, all of those things. And when we met about 13 or 14 years ago now, we really connected on this topic. And so much of our friendship has been around learning and growing and evolving as human beings. So um, we knew when we wanted to do a business, it had to be in the space because it was something we were both truly passionate about. And we it was something that we wanted to continue to live and breathe. And um, share with the world. So that's where the idea for creating a business like that came about. Initially, we were going to launch with mindfulness events that got kiboshed after COVID hit. So we had to put that uh, aside and we ended up creating our first product. Um, in terms of the name Mahara itself, uh, it was really important for us to come up with a name that was really meaningful and personal for us. So the word Mahara really captures the vision for our business, which is to help humanity live mindfully. And we discovered the name when we started reflecting on the places in the world that we felt most at peace, the most zen. And for me, it was New Zealand. New Zealand was the first, first place that I went to where I was just so at peace and so connected to my spirit. And I never felt like that anywhere else in terms of a place I visited. And when we, and when Shiva was thinking about her place, it was Oman. So Oman was a place that she grew up in. And so what we ended up doing was looking up, okay, what does mindfulness mean in the Maori language in New Zealand, which is the Indonesians that live there. 
and it means uh, mahara. So mindfulness means mahara in that language. We're like, oh, I wonder what that means in Arabic in Oman. And in Oman, so in Arabic, it means building exceptional life skills. So mindfulness and building exceptional life skills from those two places, we're like, this is just meant to be. Mahara really represents what we stand for as a business and it really has a personal meaning for us. So we went with that name. We tested it out with a lot of people. They all loved it. They all said it, it evoked that feeling of calm. It, it achieved what we wanted it, it to achieve and um, it's really close to our hearts. So that's where, how we created the name. Yeah, it's a beautiful name. I mean, for me, I think of something totally different. I mean, as you explained, it's a beautiful meaning. For whatever reason, I always think Sahara, I think desert. I think like it's also calm in the desert as well, but obviously not even close to how you yeah. came up with the name. Yeah, but. for most people, that's what we want to be. We want yeah. other people, if they hear the name, that it evokes a sense of calm and peace. So makes sense. Um, and yeah, you have a, you launched your first product, the Human Being Journal, uh, which yeah. I thought was cool. I wish I knew about it because my sister got me the five minute journal. So maybe after I've yeah. done this, I will check out your product because uh, journaling mm -hmm. is something I did before then because of COVID and obviously having kids totally dropped the ball on it, but very useful yeah. kind of practice to kind of keep up doing regularly. So tell us why yeah. you called it the human being journal. Um, and then we'll kind of talk really about all this buzz you were able to kind of create around the product, like getting into Indigo and just being where you're featured. So yeah, talk about that. This episode is sponsored by nobody. That's right, nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. Yeah, so uh, the journal. So we would actually say it's a really great compliment to something like the five minute journal because the five minute journal is something you do daily. And the human being journal is a monthly guided journal. So it's something that looks at your life holistically um, and it helps you really capture your life vision up front and then every month tracking your accomplishments and learnings and then diving deeper into some of the key topics and areas of your life that you may not necessarily do. So just to take a step back, the concept for the Human Being Journal came about for us actually several years ago when she and I were watching this webinar series with Oprah and spiritual leader Eckhart Tolle. And it was around his book, The New Earth. I don't know if you've ever yes, read it, but yeah. he, so he talks about this concept um, where Basically, like to live a fulfilled life, you need to be, um, to live a fulfilled life as a human being, you need to maximize the human side of your life and your being side of your life. So the human side really speaks to what we do in our life. So our outer selves and these earthly identifiers of success. And the being side really refers to the true essence of who we are. So that's timeless and formless, and that's our spirit. And it's only really when you bridge both worlds that you can unleash your full potential. And when we were watching this, for some reason, like both of us, it just really resonated. It was such a simple concept, but it resonated so deeply with us. And we knew we had to do something with it. We didn't know what it was. Um, until fast forward to 2020, we decided let's create a journal around this concept that helps people tap into the human side and the being side. So the way the journal is laid out, it actually um, incorporates 10 key elements. So that includes the human and being side. So everything from your relationships to your finances, career, health, to giving back your mind, um, all of those things. And it asks you to really reflect and dive deep into what that means for you. So up front, you kind of build your life vision. And then every month you revisit what your goals are. And then you answer questions around those 10 key topics. So it's a monthly journal. It's meant for people who are really busy. I know I've been journaling for most of my life and I've never really found a journal that had all of these things I would always pull from different places and I'm also really busy so I don't have time to journal every day even if I wanted to so I find a monthly practice really works with my schedule as well and it's something that I can commit to and it's a time where you really deep dive so it's not meant to be a journal that you do very quickly and you walk away every month you devote like an hour or so to really taking time to reflect it's a self-care practice and 
we truly believe by the end of the year, if you do it from start to finish, you'll just get to know yourself better. And the more you know yourself, the more you can live your life in a mindful way. Um, so that really is what the journal is about. It's more of a deep dive versus something that you do quickly every day. Um, yeah, as you're talking, the entrepreneur in me kind of got, got very excited in the sense that I guess I'm sure you've thought of this and uh, but like for me, it's like I understand that definitely the value of like a physical product because it's just like why like I have a bookshelf versus like like an e-reader. Um, have you did you ever give any thought to, you know, this is a great concept. I love kind of what the journal, as you explained it, why it's kind of what it is. Have you ever thought about kind of making either like a digital version of it, either like an app or like a website? Because I know there's some products like that or even even this whole process, even though it's supposed to be self-guided having like a course or some kind of um, guided process where somebody's kind of walking you through this, even though it should be kind of a, you know, a fairly straightforward exercise. Is that something that well, ever came to funny mind? Funny because everybody asks us, I got it. oh, do you have an app or do you have a digital version? And we were really, we had thought about it, but we decided we do not want to do a digital version or an app because from a scientific perspective and from a mental health perspective, it's actually very, very powerful when you put pen to paper, because there's a power that comes from writing your thoughts down physically um, versus on it through a digital platform. And a lot of people have also asked us, can we write in our journal with a pencil? Because they're scared to put their thought with ink permanently on paper, because there's, there's this fear that somebody may read your journal, somebody may pick it up. There's a lot of fear around journaling and it's something that you almost have to overcome and it's part of that practice. So it's so we intentionally did not do an app and we don't plan on doing an app for a product like this. We may do other mindfulness-based apps in the future, but for this journaling and the journaling practice, we truly believe the power comes from sitting down and writing in a physical book. Um, we do, in, we're just getting started. So we only launched at the end of last year and that was to test out our product to see if we were gonna get momentum and traction. And our plan now is really build out that human being piece. And like you said, we are going to do more videos and more um, pieces that will help people like go through the journey with, uh, with them and all of us do it together. So we're gonna have a lot more supporting content to help. The reason I ask is because um, I'm a very reflective person, but I find mm -hmm. there's not a lot of people that are. It's kind of hard to find that community of people to reflect with or like kind of get inspired with versus like, yeah. I, I don't know if maybe it's kind of, uh, I need to expand my horizon people I hang out sometimes, but it's just really around kind of. All us. <laughs> we, we love reflecting. This is uh, what we do. I love talking time. to people that are very like reflective because, you know, you kind of get into like, kind of the, you know, the weeds and the, the, the deep conversation. So just having a community of people that you can kind of, that can kind of ask you things that you might've not thought of about yourself would be cool, which is the only reason I brought it up. So, yeah. No, definitely. Building our community is really important and that's another area of focus that we're going to do. And we're going to be launching events and others uh, the thought leadership side of things that we want to do. So there's a lot we want to do with this business. The journal is sort of that first entry point, uh, but we want to do more and we want to meet like-minded people. And we want to share this message with, with everyone and learn from each other because we're all sort of evolving and growing together. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, how did you get, so this is kind of the entrepreneur and be like, it's really impressive that you got your product into like Indigo. How did that opportunity come about? That was that a result of kind of the marketing buzz you created, or like how did that come about? Yeah, it was really exciting. So we launched in November, and within a few weeks, we got a call from the head buyer from Indigo saying the journal was on her desk and she loved it and she wanted to know how she could get it in the store. So it was really it moved very quickly. But we were really fortunate because one of the things that Shiva and I really do have and that we value so much is our network. And we have been fortunate to have been connected with a lot of people. So we met this lady who had worked at Indigo in the past. We just did a conversation with her to learn from her. And she not only worked at Indigo, she just has just a wealth of knowledge and experience in, in that world. Um, so we had a conversation with her. She was just so lovely. We all just connected. 
Um, and we said, okay, we're going to send you our journal, try it out, tell us if you like it. She really loved it. And she's like, you need to get this into the hands of the buyers at Indigo. And we're like, we don't know how to do that, like how to get it to the direct decision maker. And I think that's where it was helpful for us that she guided us to getting it to the, it get into the hands of the right person. Um, and from there, it was really up to the buyer to decide. And I think when she saw it, she really loved it. She said it was something she'd never seen before. It was very unique. Um, and then it took us about a month or so, like into January, when we actually finished the contract and with COVID and there were just so many delays and so many things we had to deal with. We started selling online in Indigo in February, and then now we're in stores nationally across the country. So it was really exciting for us. And what's really more meaningful when with the Indigo partnership is that we're really particular about the stores that we want to be in and the partnerships that we make. And Indigo was actually a leader in the mindfulness space. So a decade ago, Heather Reisman, their CEO, she really was um, ahead of the curve. She really cared about mindfulness. She created a dedicated space now in Indigo for mindfulness and wellness products. So we knew that if we were in Indigo, they would care about our product. They would protect our brand. They would be the right partner to start with um, selling on, on the retail side. So we were really fortunate and grateful for how that partnership came about. That is, um, and again, you can share what you're comfortable with, like something like Indigo where you're obviously leveraging their network and distribution to kind of get your product in the hands of folks. Um, how do they feel about you selling the product directly? Like, are there kind of certain rules or things that you have to follow because of the no, fact well, that- No, we're, yeah. we're always a direct-to-consumer company first. We, we agreed to doing a bit of an exclusive partnership with them upfront when we launched, but we were still always gonna sell on our direct-to-consumer channels. Um, but initially we negotiated, so they would be our exclusive um, seller in, sorry, in Canada, um, in store for a certain number, for a certain time period. But no, it was never an issue in terms of selling direct to consumer. Cool. Um, and then I guess in terms of, you know, obviously as a business, finances are important. So yeah. with, you know, Mahara Mindfulness, how did you guys go about funding the project? Or I guess funding the company initially and then, um, you know, are you more of like the side of bootstrapping just like forever? Or are you like, if there's an opportunity, I'll fundraise as kind of needed? Like, what's your mindset there? Well, ideally, I would love to just have bootstrapped forever. But initially, Shiva and I bootstrapped the whole business for the last, from this time we launched to now, it's been all us. Um, we, before we quit, we saved up enough money to know that we can survive and then COVID hit and there's just so many challenges along the way, but uh, we bootstrapped for the most part, but we've now reached a critical juncture in our business where we have the opportunity to really scale um, and grow. And we just, we have no choice but to get some funding. And we just actually finished our first round of fundraising. So we have some really great uh, investors on board who've signed up to be part of our journey. And they're all very aligned to our mission. They care about what we're doing and they believe in us as founders. So we're really excited. Um, we don't see ourselves like a tech business where we're doing tons of rounds of fundraising, but uh, we know that to get to that next level that we do need some financial support. So we did do some, uh, got some investors on board. And I know obviously choosing the right co-founder is tough, but now you're um, bringing more, if you want to call them cooks in the kitchen, how did you guys choose who you want to work with? How did you get them excited about what you're doing as well? Yeah, well, it's funny. We were very fortunate that we had a lot of people come out and ask us if they could invest. And we were quite particular because we could tell like we knew the people who were the right investors because they understood what we wanted to do with Mahara. They wanted, they trusted us to take the business to the next level. So they're not going to be micromanaging us. Um, and they also are strategic investors. So they're going to open the right doors for us to allow us to scale. So one of our investors has a lot of um, contacts in the retail side and so on. So it's, we want, we were really careful in terms of 
who the investors were, were they strategic investors? Did they allow us to do our jobs? Because what is a what has given us the chance to get to where we are today is the autonomy to make the right decisions, to um, to just move quite quickly, um, and to really um, to really just move the business forward in the best way we can without having to ask a ton of people if this is okay. And all of our investors are aligned, and they they trust us to take this to the next level. So that's amazing. Um, so. Obviously, you just only launched the business recently, but um, I guess the uh, you're building towards something. So, what is that big vision, or what's I guess where do you see the company in five years? Did you know that every time you left a five out of five review for this podcast, a Tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts? Okay, that's probably not true, but if there's a chance that it is, do you really want to jinx it? Leave a review. Do it for the young creative in you. Ideally. So we're so new. So we, yeah, so we just launched at the end of November. So, and our product initially is just, it's really a fall winter product. It's a gifting product. People typically buy it at the start of the year. Um, our goal now is to continue to expand in the U.S., um, build some retail partnerships there, expand our reach uh, through partnerships and reach more customers, then expand globally. Um, so we're selling to all the major markets um, not only with this product, but with some other additional mindfulness lifestyle products. And then we also want to um, incorporate our mastermind events. That's something that we're really passionate about. We're, we want to launch our own podcast as well, um, build a community. And at the end of the day, in five years, it's a win for us if our business and our products has helped people in some way, um, that they recognize Mahara as a true, authentic, genuine brand that really cares about people, that cares about making a difference. Um, and then in five years too, like really build out the charitable giving piece. So for us, um, giving back is so important and every journal that we sell, a uh, percentage uh, of the sale goes to mental health organizations right now. And we wanna do more of that. That's that's really key. So continuing to grow, we're so new. So in five years, hopefully we're profitable, we're global, um, and we're helping people. Amazing. Um, you mentioned kind of the support you have from friends and family in your network, and obviously to kind of get access to investors or, you know, like the Indigo um, example you gave. Has there been anybody that's kind of questioned your professional choices and the fact that you guys both, or at least from your perspective, you had the successful career um, in the corporate world, and then now you're, you're, you know, you're building a company that you're obviously passionate about, but maybe not everyone kind of agrees, and or maybe you're lucky and nobody does. But have you ever heard anything negative or questioning what you know that choice that you made? Um, I would say my friends have been amazing in that so many of us are like-minded, and I have a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs, so we're really supportive of each other and help each other out. I would say my family has also been extremely supportive. I do think my parents are questioned. I think I think they're used to it now because I've always taken risks and moved from different jobs and I've always been that way, but I'm sure they don't they don't understand why I can't settle down. I'm always like looking for the next big challenge, but I do feel they are really supportive they always check in they're always praying for us whenever we need we need that support so I do feel quite lucky that I have a really great network around me that has been there um, that checks in that offers a helping hand whenever we need it so I've been lucky that's amazing this question should be easy for someone like yourself uh, in terms of personal legacy how would you want to be remembered by your friends and family this is a, it's an interesting question because it is a hard one, um, but I would say, I think about this a lot and I would say, you know what, at the end of the day, I want to be remembered as someone who approached the world with kindness and compassion, um, that I was good to people and that I really embraced life in every way. And that speaks to the human being concept. Like I embrace the human side of life and the spiritual side. And I have always believed that we are spiritual beings having this human experience. And it's important to really embrace the human experience as well as that spiritual side. So it's really, I would say that <laughs> would be my legacy. It's not how much 
money I made or what I did. It's just how the impact I had on the people and the world around me. Yeah, I think um, the common, uh, the the subject you kind of bring up those kind of relationships and kind of being, human beings were social creatures by nature. Uh, but when you read kind of all the books, like, you know, um, Five People You Meet in Heaven, there's a few other ones where you kind of, people are either dead or like on death's bed. And the things they don't think about are like how much money I made or like how well I did my job. It's like, um, did I, did I help somebody out? Was I kind? What did I, you know, leave some kind of legacy where I left the world in a better place than kind of how I came into it. So everything you're kind of building in this company and codifying into this company is just kind yeah. of amazing. So big yeah. fan of that. Um, if you had a chance to kind of go back to visit 16 year old Genevieve in a time machine, you got to sit with her face to face. What do you tell her? I always say this now when I reflect back, I think it is to know your worth and don't ever second guess it because if you don't know it, someone else will tell you and it's probably not going to, it's often gonna be a lot less than what you are worth. So start doing the work really early to get to know yourself. And that can be in the form of journaling, reading, doing whatever it is you need to do, challenge yourself, get to know yourself better. And what that will allow you to do is be able to clearly articulate what you truly stand for. It'll make it easier for you to ask for what you really want. And you'll also have the confidence and the ability to say no to what you don't want. And there's an immense power that comes with that. And it's something that if more and more people learn to do early, they will, I think, make better life choices. Um, it'll benefit them in their career, but also in their personal lives. So. It's really know yourself and and know what you stand for quite early. With your like, do you work off a calendar? Like in terms of like looking at your, <laughs> like like everything, like personal work. Like do you work off a calendar? I definitely have a yeah. I think my life would be a disaster if I didn't have a calendar for sure. Um, I have to put meetings in. I have to put reminders. Make sure I call home or check in on certain people because the truth is it's when you're juggling a lot, it's very easy to miss things. I do think I've now come to realize I have a crazy ability to manage a lot and I can multitask a lot. I have this capacity to do that, but um, I am very organized and in a, from a calendar standpoint, my personal life, my work, reminders, all of those things. But I, I do, I think, yeah. And I think when you build a mindfulness company, what's great is, Every day I'm reminded to like take a moment and to pause and know when to say no or take a break. So, cause it's hard. And I would say COVID has in a weird way been, been helpful starting a business cause I didn't have to do a lot of my personal commitments cause I could just focus on the business. I couldn't see anyone. So it helped in that sense. But now as things are opening up I'm already seeing how quickly calendars can fill up and you want to say yes to everything but you can't. So it's, it's a good reminder, but definitely calendar. Calendar is my saving grace. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I have, I have everything in my calendar as well. The only reason I was going to ask is, as you're kind of talking about your answer there, when you look at your calendar, say for like a, like a week, is there anything that's kind of, you know, when you look at your calendar, like, oh, I wish I didn't have to do that? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's so funny because that definitely would have been the case years ago like or two years ago when I was working in corporate but it isn't now I'm actually I actually look forward to most of the things that we're doing because everything is a new learning experience I would say the only thing that I hate doing is I also have a place in Prince Edward County that I um, rent out as an Airbnb so what I hate doing is having to go in and check in on the house um, sometimes but and because I have to do laundry and turnover for that every once in a while so that I hate but outside of the, the menial task I would say I really look I look forward to the meetings I look forward to conversations like this um I love learning so the more I can immerse myself the more I can learn it's very exciting for me so so how do you learn like um do you like is there a book or like a podcast that you listen to recently like in the last couple of years it's had a really profound impact on you i would say in terms of learning so i listen to a lot of podcasts because i drive back and forth from toronto and prince edward county a lot um and because i'm learning so much about the e-commerce space and starting businesses i've been listening to 
podcasts around that. So how I built this founder podcast, oh, yeah. those yeah. ones have really helped me. Yeah. Yeah. I love and how then, I built this. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. It's great. And then there's fun ones like Reply All. And I do enjoy listening to podcasts. I do also love reading. I just wish I had more time for it. Um, and I started to read more fiction because I haven't in so long because I've been learning about business so much. But I read a book recently that was really interesting called. Um, the Midnight Library um, by Matt Haig, and it explores the journey of a woman in her 30s, and she basically has a lot of regrets in her life, and she's at a point where she feels really alienated and unhappy, and she gets to like the point of um, despair where she just really doesn't want to live, and she comes across this Midnight Library that allows her to choose, make a different choice, um, in her life. So the book really just explores her making different choices um, where she thought she had regrets. And it just was an interesting book because it was about self-discovery, understanding how one choice can really change the path and direction of your life and the outcome. So I really enjoyed reading that recently. Recommend it if you haven't read it. But. That sounds like a great book because like I, especially during COVID, I've kind of put a lot of thought into these small things that I did and you know maybe I'm I am I believe I am where I'm supposed to be but you know it's like friendships that are like I could have you know worked harder to keep or you know taking care of this or that it's just kind of you reflect on that it, the book you were talking about sounds like a great way to kind of do that I guess I the way I do it is sometimes unhealthy where you kind of get fixated on mistakes you made you're like I really want an opportunity to kind of go back in time and fix it but it is what it is so yeah. Oh my gosh. I need to look back now and I, you, you like are hard on yourself in the moment, but you realize how much you grow from those um, mistakes as you may call it, but it's just all learning experiences and it takes you to where you, where you are now. So. Yeah. And like you talked about being spiritual. Like if you, if you believe in a God, like I believe that sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And like what you thought was like a, this really bad thing that happened to you kind of look back and it's like, Oh, actually, I was protected from something even worse than I thought. Like it was actually a good thing. So what's a new be uh, belief, behavior, habit that, you know, you've kind of adopted and recently that's really improved your life? So this is not a, a unique one because I think a lot of people do this, but for me, it was a new habit, which is working out in the morning. So I was somebody who always used to work out after work at the end of the day. And I was so exhausted. I didn't like it. I forced myself to do it because I know it's good for me. And the habit that I changed and I did this after quitting my job because I had the time and I could control my schedule was working out in the morning. And even if it was a half hour, hour, whatever it was, I found that the domino effect of doing that is so powerful because it just starts off your day on the right note you eat healthier the rest of the day you have more energy you sleep better it's such a simple change just like the timing but for me it's a simple habit that has changed my life I don't know why I didn't listen to everyone else before who said <laughs> thing in the morning but I do I do do it more now so I'm I'm really happy about that change and the caveat I uh, that's something I've kind of got back into doing the caveat that I would add is I I always didn't want to do it because I didn't want to do it at five or six o'clock in the morning. I do it like at almost midday, kind of like a nice break or pick me up. Yeah. Um, and I would also add, I think it's like important for people to do what works for them. I've seen people go from not working at all to like seven days a week. I'm like, that's yeah. like unsustainable for me. So I, I just do it like three or four days a week. So that's a great habit. Um, who's somebody in the global Tamil community that you admire and why? And who's somebody that isn't that you admire and why? Money can be hard to come by, but here is a $100 opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win $100 when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? It's <sighs> a hard one. I think in terms of the Tamil community, like I definitely would look to the people around me. I'm surrounded by the most amazing family and cousins that it's so hard to pick one because my parents, are incredible. I am who I am because of them, because of where they come from, what they taught me, their strength, their resilience. Like I 
so hard to meet people like that um, who I and who, who you have exposure to day to day. So I would say my parents, if I had to pick somebody new who, this is a, probably not expected, but my little goddaughter, she is going to be nine years old. And when I think about her and she's Tamil, she has been the light in my life. And what's so interesting about her is I just watch how she behaves. And she has this really unique ability where she is able to connect with people on a level I've never really seen, where it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, whether you have a disability or not. She just looks at people in the world in such a unique, inclusive way that is so powerful that I think it takes people lifetimes to learn. And there's this thing, this quality that I see in her that's very special and I really admire and respect. Um, and I really believe we need more people like that in the world. So I would say that from a Tamil uh, standpoint. Um, in terms of non-Tamil, so I don't really have big, like I don't really look up to that many people. I learn from so many different people, but the one person who's no longer living, who I really admire is Audrey Hepburn. And the reason I choose her is because when I look at the human being elements, I think she actually embodies so much of it. So she really embraced the human side of life. She loved her career and she was successful. She um, challenged herself. She loved fashion and she did all of those things, but she was also really embraced the being side. She was such a good human being. She was so charitable. Um, she was a humanitarian. And even after her death, she her legacy continues to live on and it continues to change people's lives. So I would say those are my, my two. A great way to, you know, great answer and a great way to segue into the last part of the podcast, which is a game that I call Creator Confessions. Basically, I'm going to say a bunch of statements and you're going to kind of give me the first answer that kind of pops into your mind. Ready? Okay. Awesome. Favorite Tamil food? Favorite Tamil food? I love puttu. <laughs> it's my favorite. Like so, white puttu is my favorite. And just by itself or with anything? Oh, with the tumble. Got it. That's it. Are you vegetarian? No, I eat more plant-based foods, but I'm not vegetarian. Okay. I did go vegetarian for a year and decided, no, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Something that scares you? Um, I really hate uh, mice. <laughs> <laughs> Inse insecurity that you have. Insecure. Just, um, not living to my full capacity. So I don't know if that's an insecurity. It's just that is yeah. Um, yeah. Favorite show you're watching? Oh, uh, what's it called? The one with Nicole Kidman. The eight perfect strangers and nine perfect strangers oh i've heard of that okay yeah a place you're itching to travel to after the pandemic is over oh my goodness so many places uh south america i have not traveled around south america so argentina hopefully in the winter and then yeah that's the first place for sure a fellow tamil creator that you want to give a shout out to to you for bringing people <laughs> together. I think it's amazing that you're doing this and really embracing and bringing Tamil people together in this way. I think it's so important and um, love the work that you're doing and connecting the community. So thank you. I will you. take it. <laughs> um, favorite childhood memory? Oh, gosh. Okay. That's such a hard one. My favorite childhood memory. Really, oh, that's you. such a hard <laughs> question. What is my favorite childhood memory? I honestly, no one has ever asked me that question before. Probably, like I think our first Christmas in um, in Canada because it was so different. It was so different from um, from our lives and the snow and the weather and climate and I remember my family going out of their way to make pretend like Santa Claus was coming and ringing the bells and and I love Christmas so mm. I would say that probably would be my favorite memory. That's awesome. What do you like to do for fun outside of work? 
Oh, I, other than drinking wine, I do love, I love hiking. So I love just going out in nature, hiking whenever I can. I would say that's my favorite thing to do. It brings me back to my center very quickly. Favorite film of all time? Uh, Good Will Hunting. I love Good Will Hunting. It's like to this day, it's still one of my favorite movies for sure. Good choice. Uh, what's a purchase you've splurged on recently that you have no regret about? I haven't bought any. I haven't gone shopping because I'm <laughs> an entrepreneur, a poor entrepreneur. <laughs> I actually have to be perfectly honest I haven't really bought anything in the last outside of things for our business I actually haven't bought anything like a splurge item the last thing I bought was my car that was more of a splurge but it, it was a used car so nothing special <laughs> still a splurge um pet peeve um my pet peeve I just don't like people who are pretentious. I That drives me crazy. I don't know if that's a pet peeve, but you can just sense it right away and it turns me off big time. Um, if you knew that you were gonna die tomorrow, a regret that you would have? Um, if I was gonna die tomorrow? Oh, that I didn't, that I didn't go see my family this past weekend and I had to come down to the county I'd probably regret that I should have been there um just give them a good like a big hug but it just sometimes you can't be everywhere all at once but I would definitely regret it for sure um uh, age you want to retire by and when I say retire my definition is ownership of time so do what you want when you want but I'll let you answer but I feel like you already kind of have that but I'll, I'll let you answer <laughs> age that I want to retire by. I hope by in the next five years, three to five years, I'm in a place where I have freedom to do whatever it is that I want to do. I'm kind of in that place now where I'm building, building my life that way. But. Um, a celebrity whose life you would want to experience for one day? Oh, good question. Hmm. Probably, it probably would be an Oprah. Oprah just meets the most incredible people. She has conversations with the most inspiring people. I would love to just see what her day, what her day is like and who she interacts with and how she's built her business and um, empire. So, yeah. And finally, what's a piece of advice that you would give to your fellow creators out there? I would say the biggest piece of advice I would give is just know your why in terms of what you're doing and why you're doing it because so many times people start businesses and they don't really know what why they're doing it because why do they value it what is their mission what is going to wake them up every morning to do that work day in and day out and if you can't answer that question every day um, in a clear way it's just going to be so hard to have that momentum and be in it for the long game so really understand why you are motivated to create this business and the impact that you want to make awesome well that's a good way to kind of end off the podcast um i guess for anybody listening that's kind of been inspired by your story and just want to connect with you to pick your brain or whatever the case might be what's the best way for someone to reach out to you um you can um well, you can follow us on Mahara. So at Ma, uh, Mahara Mindfulness, that's the easiest way on our Instagram. Or you can email me anytime. I'm at Genevieve at maharamindfulness.com. Um, and you can learn more about our business at maharamindfulness.com. Well. And is there, a, is there a kind of a final PSA that you want to kind of leave the audience with around your business or just anything that's kind of exciting that's coming up in the Mahara Mindful you know, world? Yeah, well, we are excited um, to start uh, selling, really selling our product more this fall, winter, expand in the US. If you're looking for a really great gift for yourself or a loved one, check out the Human Being Journal. Um, we promise that if you do it from start to finish, that you will gain something meaningful from that experience. Um, and yeah, 
and follow us at Mahar Mindfulness because we really do want to build a community and we want to grow and we're working on a lot of great content that we're going to be sharing over the next few months. So, so join us on this journey. And guys, believe me, you can't see it on video, but I don't think she stopped smiling this whole podcast. So whatever they're doing at Mahara, there's something there. Get the, get the journal. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Genevieve, for kind of jumping on the podcast. Uh, you're awesome to talk to. And I know people are going to kind of enjoy this episode. And for those of you listening, appreciate you guys as always. Thank you so much.